What are you two read or a fish? I mean, what do I say about that? Mr. Sushi? And he appears to be not a fish, but a piece of sushi. With arms. The only small mercy here is that they didn't film this live action. Otherwise it would be an American guy in yellow face called Mr. Human Meat. But because they always have this f***ing smile on their face, I feel nothing. I see this, I feel nothing. Dark thoughts, maybe. Hello, lovely people. My name is Emma, and you don't know what I've been through to get here. It's cold outside, I've hurt my back. I don't think that's related to this movie, but I'm choosing to blame it anyway. Look, listen, I love fish. I went to the aquarium recently. I consider them all my friends. The piranhas may be just colleagues, but I love fish. I love aquatic life. I have never wanted to punch a fish before. This was... Right, I've, I've definitely at least once said that something is the worst. Whatever that was, I was wrong. This is the worst thing. It's just the worst. The film I'm going to be sharing with you today is called Finding Jesus. Is that indicative of the content of the film? No, not really. This is made by a company called Wow Now Entertainment. They have formerly gone by many different names. I think they just have some sort of SEO robot that names everything for them and changes their company name when it seems appropriate. I don't know. They seem to exist purely to churn out the most low effort quick to produce, uh, the name is always ripped off of something mainstream. In my notes I wrote like, they seem to exist purely to just rip off movies in awful quality for some reason. In hindsight, the reason is money. Just have a look for a second at their absolutely horrifying and also slightly broken website. Do you see what I'm dealing with here? I mean, what is that? What is that? So that's an early signifier of the type of quality we can expect to see from Wow Now Entertainment. Let me explain this film, this experience to you. I watched it so that you don't have to, so let's let's just get through this. Oh, the stress. I don't know about you, but stress makes me break out. <gasps> Good segue to today's sponsor. Today's video is sponsored by Geology. Has this ever happened to you? You're innocently posting a nice little picture of yourself to the internet, and all of a sudden, I can tell you've been eating sweets because of your spot. <laughs> oh, I've only been using Geology for a little while and I already feel improvements in my skin, especially under my eyes. One of my big problem areas is dark circles, which people also point out. <laughs> <laughs> the reason Geology is so effective is because it's personalised, it's skincare and hair care just for you. It's super easy, you take this 30 second quiz, you tell them about your skin goals and your problem areas and they come up with a routine just for you. So I have this personalised routine and I'm going to show you this card. This is my favourite thing about Geology, right? I get confused. <laughs> I get confused easily and when there's a million skin products out there and there's a million different brands and they're all called different things sometimes I like to get a beauty box I get a bit of makeup in the post and I'll open it up and I'll be like ah perfection cream where do I rub it and what does it do and the text on the back is so small by the time your eyes have adjusted you realize it's all written in French you'll never know Geology doesn't do that. Geology makes it really, really easy. You literally, I filled in the quiz, I got regimen number 20. So you get this little card that explains everything. Certified vegan and cruelty free for my animal lovers. I know we're hating on fish in this one, but I do genuinely love animals. It has a list of every single ingredient in every single product and on the back it tells you what the active ingredients are and what they do. Any of you out there share this problem with me. I've never created a habit in my life. I've never started a habit. I can't do it. Geology gives you this little card that says, here's your specific skincare. Here's what you do in the morning, in this order. Here's what you do at night, in this order. And then the packaging even has numbers on it. So you can see my uh, face wash is number one. So if you have extras that aren't part of the morning or evening routine, so I've got the morning routine is my uh, cleanser and then tone control for the morning. And then at night I've got obviously cleanse again, wash my face. And then I've got eye cream for my circles and night cream. I've also got uh, sunscreen and performance moisturiser. If someone like me was like, 
I don't know when to put on sunscreen. Or performance moisturiser probably would have been the better example. You get a separate card for each of those that tells you when to use them and exactly what's in it and the active ingredients. It's just made so simple. Geology is 26 times award winning. It's got over 7,000 five star reviews. The people love it. Whether you're like me and you've got the dark circles, you've got acne problems. If you want to combat wrinkles, puffy skin, you just want to keep your skin smooth and hydrated skincare is for everyone. All you need, all anyone needs, is a simple, tailored routine. Follow the QR code, use my link down below, get 100% off your skincare routine. All you have to cover is the shipping, it's $4.95. You can't find a better deal out there, not even on their website. On top of that, you get 30% off a skin, hair or body add-on of your choice when you add it to your trial. Scan the QR code, follow the link down below, use code EMMATHORN100, get that 30% off a bonus item. Thank you to Geology for sponsoring this video and my skin. Film opens. Title card, Finding Jesus. There's no pomp and circumstance here, it's just title card and go. Enter the narrator. It's a beautiful underwater day in the ocean. What accent was that? And forgive me for being pedantic, but isn't every day an underwater day in the ocean? Oh God, Jesus! We dive, if you'll pardon the pun, straight into introducing our protagonists, the allegedly baby fish. I think these fuckers are too big to be babies, but whatever. Muggles. Muggles. And Joy. Could have given them biblical names. Could have called them anything. Muggles and Joy. Muggles. I spent a minute trying to work out what type of fish, what breed of fish these are. I couldn't do it. If you have an idea, let me know in the comments. I hate when this little bastard fills up the screen. It's so scary. The creators of this film have never heard of Headroom. Imagine if I filmed all my videos, I can't even fit. Imagine if I filmed all my videos like this. You'd be scared, no? Muggles and Joy unbelievable, are searching for food to eat, delicious algae. Joy has a regular adult woman's voice, which is weird because they're meant to be babies, but I'll take it over the utterly intolerable voice they've given muggles. They're swimming around talking about how, oh, my back, I really have twinged something. They're swimming around talking about how awesome it is to be doing what you were born to do, which is clumsy as fuck. I mean, children don't talk like that. Also because they're literally just eating. They're just, they're just looking for food. Woohoo! Wow. What could be better? <laughs> <laughs> Mom, come pick me up. I'm scared. It's not a phone. It's a Tamagotchi. He's pooped on the floor. Kids. Am I right? This is Shaikuchi. He's a shark with a six pack. Better than any character you will find in this movie. They're looking for algae, right? In these desolate fucking waters. I mean, there is nothing here. That's it. Bubble transition away from whatever the fuck that was, and now we're in Bubble Town. It's never called Bubble Town out loud. They just refer to it as the reef. Stuff like this makes me a little bit suspicious just because, having perused their other films and read a couple of reviews, it seems like they reuse a lot of not just the assets, but the writing and the dialogue across their films. They will recycle whatever they have to and repackage it into something new just to have something that can vaguely be titled in a similar way to a mainstream movie. It's gross, okay? It's gross. I hate it. I'm getting heated, so I'm gonna have to take my jumper off. On the plus side, you get to see another stinky Katie shirt. This one is Woke Up, Day Ruined. Next, we are introduced to Professor Shark who is strong and caring and... Look, I am jazzed by any positive representation of sharks. I think they're beautiful, I love them, they're the puppies of the sea. Especially... Black and white tip reef sharks, nurse sharks, the kind of sharks you'd expect to see in like a shallow coral reef. But doesn't this fucker look like a predator? They could have gone for something less terrifying, is what I'm saying. Muggles and Joy appear and Professor Shark is fucking stoked to see them. They all gush more about how gosh dang amazing this day is because they've been eating. Jesus sure has blessed us with lives in such a beautiful underwater universe. Underwater universe? Never mind. More pressingly, how did the word of Jesus spread to the ocean floor? Professor Shark is like, you kids are amazing because you love Jesus. You could teach the other fish a thing or two. And Muggles is like, but we're literally children. <laughs> While Muggles is talking, we get these like 
reaction shots of Joy and Professor Shark, but they only have one expression, so they're not actually reacting. It just makes it really weird. It's just like, while one of them is talking, the rest of them are like... Jesus is very, very pleased with you! I hate this. <laughs> Why is it so creepy? Why does Professor Shark talk like that? But good news, everyone! Professor Shark is not the only character this guy voices, and it is far from his worst. Let's just talk for a second about the animation. It is so lazy. No wonder WoW now makes so many films. Like, this looks like they took about 10 minutes. All the characters have one expression, and whenever they speak, their mouths move rhythmically up and down, like this. Bah, 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 bah. There's not even a teeny tiny attempt to sync their mouths to the dialogue. They literally just cycle this animation. Bah, 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 bah. Again, imagine even my content. Hello, lovely people. My name is Emma. As a former VFX editor, I want you to know that watching this film hurt my soul. I don't think I even believe in the concept of a soul, and yet I felt pain in it watching this. Professor Shark tells Muggles and Joy that we, it's unclear who we is, are having a problem and maybe they can help. We love solving problems! Just ask Algebra Albacore. Algebra Albacore. As per, the babies are super excited by everything ever, so they love solving problems and will absolutely help. This is the most damning and funniest indictment of the effort put into the dialogue syncing. I see. Apparently the problem is a personal one to do with a friend of theirs. Scary Henry. He's always had a bad reputation. Maybe because his name is fucking Scary Henry. Kids, for some reason, serial killer Stan has a terrible reputation. Now I'm excited because this sounds like the first character I can actually get behind. Spoiler alert, he is my favourite. Scary Henry is unhappy and they don't know why. Professor Shark thinks he could use a bit of a pep talk. When Professor Shark says that though, he takes about five years to say it in a really roundabout way. I can imagine them these people in the vocal booth trying desperately to stretch the dialogue to fill the goddamn runtime. If Professor Shark spoke at a normal speed and without repeating himself five times, this would be half as long, and I would only have had to endure half an hour of this trauma. As long as we have all our fins and gills, life's just peachy. This could create an awkward scenario if he's lost a limb or something. A curse upon this film for teaching children to deal with suffering in this way. For encouraging them to go up to their friends who are suffering and be like, life is a gift because Jesus, it's never really that bad. And destining them to become the intolerable member of the friend group that everyone secretly hates. Finding Jesus does do one thing for Christianity. It does make me grateful for all the religious people in the world who aren't fucking insufferable like these piss-taking fish. The fish are still talking about how dope life is under any and all circumstances. For example, Clyde the Porpoise, there is no consistency in the naming of characters in this world. Professor Shark, Scary Henry, and Clyde. I mean, Clyde lost his dorsal fin in a tsunami, and now he's more streamlined. I don't know what to say. <laughs> I don't know what to say. The whole time they're talking about this, their faces are still frozen in this creepy smile. Is this a horror film? Remember when Clyde lost his dorsal fin in the tsunami? Professor Shark finally tells Muggles and Joy to go and talk to Scary Henry. In Jesus' name! This is the first time we see a character actually move, as in move out of place, not just the, the idle animation cycle. And I just wanted to show you because I think it's really funny. You can hide a lot with motion blur. That's all I'm saying. The weirdly faux English narrator is back to telling us what we already know, that Muggles and Joy are off to talk to Scary Henry. There's a dog barking outside. You've made it angry with your accent. <coughs> See? Turns out Scary Henry is a crab with a much smilier face than I expected. This is Scary Henry. Scary Henry. Scary Henry tells the fish how life stinks and he doesn't even have a reef to call home and I suddenly realised at this point that he is also trying to do an English accent. Why is this happening? Did the creators of Finding Jesus watch like a Planet Earth documentary and assume that David Attenborough's voice is like representative of animal life? Not to labour this point too much, but for any budding artist types watching, it is possible to make your characters actually look sad so that you don't have to telegraph their emotions audibly all the time while they look happy as fucking Larry. It's insane. The fish are telling him that, hey, he can come to their reef, and also his outlook is terrible. 
Now cheer him up. And by the way, Jesus loves you. And if we're alive on this earth, then we're home because Jesus made us this amazing playground. A, or one, tell that to humans lost at sea. And B, no he didn't. Jesus didn't make shit, except for a bunch of fish. And they ate those. They're trying to cheer up this crab while still calling him Scary Henry to his face. Right to his face. Which he points out! You try being the life of the party when everybody calls you Scary Henry. And they don't apologise. They don't even acknowledge it. I was obviously still expecting way too much at this stage, because I thought they were going to say, Sorry Henry, we'll go tell everyone to stop calling you that. No, they don't give a fuck. Muggles and Joy suggest they go see this old lady fish because she likes everyone and maybe she'll have some wisdom to share. A scary Henry is like, no, don't wanna. He's like, if she says something useful, come find me and you know, fair enough. One small point, one minuscule half point to this film for actually not having these shitty little characters cheer this character up straight away. Minus 800 points, the design and the animation and the voices and the- Muggles and Joy find big old Mrs. Wadley. Big old Mrs. Wadley. Why is the way this film talks about people so rude? <laughs> We've just come from Mr. Miserable Bastard, now we're off to chat to Mrs. Huge Old Fucker. <laughs> Mrs. Wadley, which implies the existence of a never addressed Mr. Wadley. <laughs> so did you take his name or? under fucking evil. Mrs. Wadley is like, oh, how you've grown. I think it's the narrator again doing this voice. But now she's like, Southern US for some reason. And once again, we're greeted by a character who talks in slow fucking motion. There is no way they didn't do that for filler reasons. It is agony. Joy tells Mrs. Wadley that their friend is unhappy and she reasons that they need a lesson in gratitude. Oh, they're unhappy? Little bastard's probably just not grateful enough. When I was a little fish, we had to swim 10 miles to get to school and it was against the current both ways. It is now certain that this film's point is that being unhappy is your own dang fault, you ungrateful little shit. Not like, give your friends time and support, maybe do things to cheer them up. No, no, no. You berate them about how they're missing out on the awesomeness of life and taking Jesus for granted, or something. Mrs. Wadley says exercising our gratitude to God can work wonders in our lives. I'm telling you, I've never wanted to slap a fish before. Today's full of new experiences. I never get crabby when I remember to regularly thank Jesus for everything. Pull the other one, mate. A child never gets grumpy if they just thank Jesus often enough. In your dreams, presumably overly strict parent who wrote this script. Mrs. Wadley tells Muggles and Joy that this is a great time to turn to the good book. Which... Do they have like a laminate waterproof version? Can fish read human languages or do they have their own? So many questions. I got distracted in this scene by some of the ocean assets that have been plopped haphazardly in the background. How lazy do you have to be to not even check every stupid clam is actually on the floor before you finalise the film? Mrs. Wadley reads a psalm about giving thanks to the Lord and that's it. Muggles and Joy return to Scary Henry. Sorry, excuse me. They return to Scary Henry to pass on this advice. And yes, they are still calling him Scary Henry to his face after he told them it was making him depressed. Anyway, they go ahead and tell him he's not grateful <laughs> enough and we can all be happy by thanking Jesus for stuff. And because this film is stupid, that actually works. They repeat the psalm to him, they, yes, they repeat it verbatim, even though we heard it two minutes ago. Uh, it seems to cheer him up. I see a smile. Oh, that's definitely a smile. His face is exactly the same. He's always smiling. You're all always smiling. Scary Henry thanks them and Joy is like, we didn't do anything. It was all Jesus. It always is. Listen, if I hold a door open for someone and they thank Jesus instead of me, I'm gonna be pissed. I don't know if the makers of this are even Christian, or if like Christian safe kids TV is just a good money maker. I wouldn't like to speculate, but this point is such a ridiculous piece of nonsense, this stupid old idea that everything good that happens is thanks to Jesus and we should be so grateful, but when bad things happen, it's the evil atheists that are angry at God because of bad things happening. It just, it doesn't make sense. It does not make sense. I'm losing my mind. Muggles and Joy return to Professor Shark in what appears to be an exact copy-paste of the earlier scene, just with slightly different dialogue, 
And I just had to pause for a second to recap myself what happened. In the film, Muggles and Joy recount all they've learned about being thankful. Here's my rundown. Scary Henry told the kids that he was unhappy because everyone calls him Scary Henry and he has nowhere to call home. They cheered him up by telling him to be more grateful to Jesus. Everyone is still calling him Scary Henry, right to his stupid, smiley crab face. And they bug it off back to their reef without him. There's no way he's actually happier. Henry was absolutely just getting rid of the douchebag missionary kids at his door. Yeah, yeah, I feel much better, thanks. Uh, see you later. What is this actually teaching children, though? When your friend tells you what's making them sad, especially if it includes bullying by you and everyone else, ignore them and find some unrelated Bible verse to parrot at them. Make sure you keep using the insulting nickname they told you they hate. The three amigos, Muggles, Joy, and Professor Shark all laugh about what a big help Jesus is. And then Muggles and Joy head back into the abyssally empty open ocean for another fun-filled adventure. Woohoo! Yay! Woohoo! Woo! Literally chill the fuck out, it's just empty ocean. That's the end of that scene and we just cut back to the empty ocean once again and they're on their way home now. The narrator introduces their names again and this is the point where I realise that this film is actually a series of 10 minute shorts stuck together with bits of stock footage and bubble animations. That's genuinely what this is. I bet it was a series of 10 minute YouTube shorts and then they put it into a film so they could call it Finding Jesus. Unbelievable. People really are that lazy and money hungry. Once again, Muggles and Joy are swimming through the great emptiness talking about what brilliant friends they are. <sighs> Back to Professor Shark at Bubble Town, and yes, it is exactly the same sequence of shots as earlier. Copy paste, copy paste, new episode. This time the narrator says that Professor Shark always has a mission for the kids, which is weird because I thought he was the teacher. You know, Professor Shark. It's not easy swimming around with all these new predators in the sea. Um, are the new predators meant to be humans? Is that a dig at overfishing, or am I reading way too much into this garbage? Not only does Professor Shark not give a single fuck about these babies swimming alone in the predator-filled ocean, but he's uh, sending them back out again. There's another problem! This time it's with Marlo the Swordfish. They all have a good, hideous laugh about how Marlo can surely cut himself out of any problem. Because <laughs> he's a swordfish. Professor Shark is like, he's stuck in some seaweed. And you know, if he can't swim, then he can't breathe. What the fuck? Is he already dead? How long did Professor Shark wait for these two tiny children to appear so that he could send them to save Marlo? Justice for Marlo, what the fuck? Professor Shark doesn't know exactly where Marlo is, but not to worry. But his distress signal was picked up by pickles. That is not a sentence you hear a shark say every day. His distress signal. He's got a little radio? What the fuck are you talking about? Joy and Muggles say that with the distress signal they can hone in on his position quickly. How long has Marlo been stuck, Professor? Stop asking questions! Just go! Man's life is on the line! Stop smiling! The only way this scene works for me, and granted it has to stop being children's media for my version, is if they get there and Marlo's already dead. Because they've been fucking around chatting for too long. You sure care about your friends? Why haven't you gone yet? Despite the fact that Professor Shark and the fishies keep feigning urgency, apparently there's enough time for a quick lesson about how love and friendship are gifts from Jesus. There's a real lesson to learn here about how focusing on evangelizing instead of doing real work to help your friends is a bad move. But not according to this film. Muggles and Joy are back in the open ocean, and the narrator claims they swim like never before, despite the animation telling a different story, which is that they're going the exact same slow speed they always go. And smiling. Obviously still smiling. Our friend might be dead. <laughs> I've lost Marlo's distress signal, Muggles. Lost it on what? Is it a telepathic distress signal? Suddenly, pickles. <laughs> I love pickles. I'll be honest, I did cheer up at pickles. Until I deciphered he was attempting, I think, a Scottish accent? You should have seen him. It was amazing. Why are they doing accents that they can't do in this show? Why don't they just use their normal accents? Anyway, thankfully, because otherwise he would be dead with the time that we've taken to get here, turns out Marlo freed himself. Muggles and Joy decide to visit him anyway to say, congrats, <laughs> lol, <laughs> congrats on escaping a near-death experience, I guess, uh, and to check if he's okay, which is the first normal thing they've done this whole time. Anyway, here's Marlo. He looks nothing like a swordfish, but whatever, I guess. Marlo is positively shook that his friends came all the way out here to see him and help him. 
And Joy is like, of course we honour your friendship. It's a gift from Jesus. Ah, oh, Snotka's like, I'm a nice person and we get on well and, you know, maybe maybe I've got some good traits and, and it's just nice to help your fellow man. It's just because of Jesus. Okay, bit of a bummer, but never mind. So I'm watching this lengthy <laughs> celebration of our wonderful friendship and I can't help but think about the whole scary ocean predators conversation from earlier and the fact that swordfish are also carnivores. Marlo is so grateful, even though Muggles and Joy didn't do shit. <laughs> He's so happy that he leads them to a delicious load of algae that he found, yay. They're excited, they're gonna bring everyone here tomorrow. Marlo is like, awesome. You know, you guys remind me of Jonathan and David from the Bible. Why? Literally just because they're really good friends. Good friends, if that's how you want to view Jonathan and David. David specifically says he loves Jonathan more than he loves any woman, but also he was married to, amongst many other wives, Jonathan's sister. Does he ever mention loving her? No. How much does he talk about loving Jonathan? All the fucking time. Big props to this movie for mentioning one of the gayest stories in the Bible. Muggles and Joy return to Professor Shark to tell him everything they've learned about friendship, blah blah blah, story over. These shorts are so formulaic they could well be put together by AI. In fact, I think a machine might do a better job. It might have actually... This might be the one situation in which a machine has more creativity than the humans that actually made it. Muggles and Joy, with a heart full of love for Jesus, are off on another adventure, which means we get this again. We're here, yay, woo, the ocean, love is so, everything's so great because of Jesus. Imagine starting every day like that. Like, I'm barely alive when I first get up. I'm barely alive now. <laughs> the kids are heading home once again after their very first time exploring new reefs. Exciting, imagine if we could have seen that. Now, you know what? I'm so glad they decided to show us this conversation in the dark, empty ocean. I would have hated to actually see a bunch of unique and vibrant reefs. Tell, don't show, that's what they say. Here we are back with Professor Shark and Muggles and Joy telling him about their day that we didn't see. Their friend Patty, I think the whale, told them about a place with buttloads of delicious algae, so they collected up a bunch and gave it to folks in the other reefs. They were dishing out algae to their new friends as they got acquainted, it's very nice. Again, so relieved that instead of seeing it, we got to look at the same three shots of these stupid characters. I'm so pleased! Professor Shark is thrilled and congratulates them for their strength. Muggles is like, yeah, we did carry a lot of algae, actually. <laughs> Professor Shark is like, <laughs> no. The Bible tells us that real strength comes from serving. If he means serving fierce looks, then I'm strong as fuck. Obviously, in this case, he actually means serving God and serving others in the name of God. Because what is the point of doing anything nice for anyone if it's not secretly, so you'll get Jesus points. The professor tells them to take the rest of the day off. Day off from what? What obligations do these children have right now? They're like a few weeks old. <laughs> they swim off and bump into their friend Fizzy. Oh God! Muggles and Joy tell their friend Fizzy the pufferfish, who is always puffed up by the way. They're only supposed to do that as a defense mechanism. So presumably Fizzy is intimidated by Muggles and Joy. They're catching Fizzy up on all their good deeds. And as soon as Joy said, yeah, we're pretty cool little fish, I knew what was coming. Fizzy is like, Haha, yeah, well, careful you don't get too prideful about that shit. Then Fizzy tells them that one time Jesus told his dinner host when he hosts a party, he should not invite his friends or neighbors because they'll be inclined to repay him. Instead, only invite people who have no way of paying you back, i.e. the poor. And you will be rewarded when the upright rise from the dead. Call me crazy. I don't know what that has to do with pride. <laughs> Luckily, Joy is here to explain it for me and all the other children watching. Working out that giving from the heart is better than expecting praise or reward. Is it really giving from the heart if you're only doing it to get points from Jesus when the upright rise from the dead? Also, important point, I think, they didn't expect any kind of reward. They literally did a good thing out of the kindness of their hearts and they were happy about it after. They can't help that. That's brain chemicals. What a stupid fucking message. I hate you, Fizzy. Fizzy's just jealous that they did something nice and are feeling good. The kids decide they should do something nice for Patty the Whale because she gave them the hot info on this algae without expecting anything in return. But according to the Jesus bit we just had, she shouldn't get anything in return. She should get no reward until the upright fish rise from the dead. Muggles asks what they could possibly do for a big old whale like Patty. And Joy is like, whoa man, don't let Patty hear you say that. She is a girl. <laughs> 
Just want to remind you that these little dickheads had no problem calling Scary Henry Scary Henry to his face, again, after he told them it was making him depressed. But if you suggest a whale is large, which obviously they are, that's bad. Would we have tackled the Scary Henry thing differently if he was a girl? This show's morals are all over the goddamn place. Jump scare warning for Patty the Whale. Jesus Christ, her eyes are bigger than her fucking fins, that is horrible! So Joy and Muggles say, I'm sorry, so Joy and Muggles say thank you to Patty, and that they've got her a gift which they lead her to, and... A yummy seabed, littered with plump crustaceans. I'm sorry, it's full of what now? Watching Finding Jesus is like gifting a frog a frog in Animal Crossing, or looking too hard at Goofy and Pluto. They are seeming- the main characters, these baby fish, are seemingly arbitrarily friends with neighbouring fish and crustaceans. They're also friends with various predators while lamenting even to one of those predators that the ocean is full of predators. But when they're friends with a predator, they will happily lead said carnivores to places full of other creatures who must also be sentient, right? Do they know the creatures here? Given Muggles and Joy have been wandering around introducing themselves to folks, that's the whole plot of this episode, and they knew this spot to lead Patty to it, it kind of follows that they've met the people that they're leading this whale here to kill and eat. Basically, what the fuck? They get to this spot and the kids are like, what do you think? And Patty sniffs. Do whales have noses? No, they don't. They have blowholes. So I guess she sniffs through her blowhole? And she's like, wow, look at them all. Crustaceans are my favourite. The three of them have a truly disgusting back and forth about how amazing this is, how kind they all are. You deserve a reward because blah, blah, blah. And then Muggles refers to the gift as a crustacean farm. Which is even more troubling for me personally. So Patty now owns all the scary Henrys here and is breeding them so she can eat them? What the fuck? Muggles and Joy go back to Professor Shark, do the whole recounting today's events thing. Again, even though they happened in real time so slowly, how hard is it to fill 20 minutes with fish-based activity? There's nothing new or interesting here, so I'll just share with you the funny way Professor Shark says Jesus, and we'll move on. And fulfilling Jesus' plan. Another day, another adventure, God in their hearts, blah blah blah. Muggles and Joy actually start this episode by saying, time to serve, woohoo, which is a little bit tragic. Once again, we start at the end of Muggles and Joy's day. They've been having a blast swimming in the open ocean. But oh shit, they haven't done the homework Professor Shark gave them. These two goody-goody little shits didn't do their homework? This is the biggest plot twist we've seen so far. They were meant to have been studying corals, and Joy and Muggles start coming up with lies that they could possibly tell Professor Shark. If this were a normal show about regular kids, I could see this working fine. Kid feels bad, starts coming up with lies, the moral is that lying is bad. Makes sense. Normal. Something that every kid and every adult goes through. The only difference in this area between being a kid and being an adult is that when you get to an adult, you realise that some lies, white lies, you're supposed to tell. Like, I love your dress, or sorry I couldn't make it, I was under the weather. Although I do long for a day when we can just say, sorry, I didn't want to come. Would make sense if it was a normal show, but everything we've seen of these two fucking goody goody little two-shoes do-nothing-wrongest bend-over-backwards vomiting kindness these are the most insanely do-gooder children that have ever existed. So the idea that not only have they been playing when they should have been doing their homework, but that they're so casually coming up with lies about it is just COMPLETELY out of character. It doesn't work, you gotta have consistency, wow now! They do agree to work extra hard tomorrow to make up for it. Which they also tell Professor Shark, amongst the lie, amongst? Once again, I have turned into Sean Connery. Along with the lie that the currents were too strong to study any reef. This turns out to be a stupid mistake because other students had seen them playing, but also, presumably, other students had the same homework and weren't affected by the currents that weren't there. This show doesn't mention that, I don't know. It's really hard to get a sense of tension. I am doing a lot of work trying to amp up the drama in this episode, because for a kid's show, the moment they know their lie is about to come undone and they're gonna get into trouble, that is like... That should be quite intense. But because they always have this fucking smile on their face, I feel nothing. I see this, I feel nothing. Dark thoughts, maybe. Professor Shark is very disappointed. And Muggles and Joy feel very ashamed. Professor Shark does graciously forgive them. Side note, I paused the film here while there was a bubble passing perfectly over Professor Shark's face. And it looks like he's got silly glasses on. Cheer me up a little bit. He wants them to get together with their reef mate, 
Mr. Flips and go and see Mr. Sushi. It's not clear why they have to see Mr. Flips to see Mr. Sushi. Like, maybe he's his secretary? I don't know. It's not really explained. There's just usually a middleman in these shows for some reason. Perhaps he can shed some light on the power of moral purity. If there's one thing I can tell you straight up Mr. Sushi is lacking, it's moral purity. Oh god. I don't know why they need Mr. Flips to do that, but they do, so here is Mr. Flips. I did hope he'd be a dolphin, but the other characters are so arbitrarily named that I wasn't sure. Phew. Mr. Flips has already heard about Joy and Muggles' misdeeds. How? Who the fuck knows? Maybe with the same technology they use to send distress signals. Mr. Flips is a real hard ass, like... I guess this is actually why Shark sent them here? Like... He's like, oh yeah, I know about you kids lying. You didn't do your work, did you, you lazy little critters? He gives them a passage from the book of Timothy about how you should ignore the fact that you're a kid and try and set the best example of purity and goodness and look, I'm sorry, Tim, not to be controversial, but I disagree with this message. I do actually think kids should be given more leeway to do things wrong and make mistakes. Their brains are still developing. They literally can't help it. And telling them they have to be like perfect adults is both dumb and inconsiderate. The great irony here is that the kids with strictest parents in this way will usually just end up lying to them. And then they never actually learn the lesson. That being said, the Bible does also say to beat and stone your children when they're naughty. So clearly we just have different ethics on raising younglings. Basically, Mr. Flips can flip off. <laughs> yeah. Mr. Flips has been told by Professor Shark to send the kids to see that curmudgeon, Mr. Sushi. Why is everyone so rude about each other in this? I'm getting stress hair. Still no idea why we needed Mr. Flips except as a middleman to fill some time. Oh well, never mind. I genuinely could not understand this one line by Mr. Flips. Maybe you can work it out. You ready to sail? I'm guessing it's meant to be ready to say hello, but folks, it's time. It's time for Mr. Sushi. There he is. Oh god. Oh god, guys, this is real. What are you two, a reed or a fish, doing so far from your reef? I mean, what do I say about that? This is the single most racist caricature I've witnessed in anything ever. Look, I was a child in the era of racist characters in cartoons, especially Asian characters. I mean, Hong Kong Fui? And yet, that era came to an end. We moved on as a society. We said, you know what? Maybe non-Asian actors putting on a shitty accent and a fake moustache and squinting their eyes, wearing the Japanese flag on a headband is maybe a bad idea. How is this real? This came out in 2020. Granted, since it's a compilation of cartoons, it probably actually was made earlier. But unless earlier was like 1950, this is not acceptable. <laughs> not only is this character almost hilariously offensive, it is also absolutely terrifying conceptually. This is worse than the main characters being friends with some crustaceans and eating others. Mr. Sushi? And he appears to be not a fish, but a piece of sushi. With arms. His body is made of of seaweed. I think they look like shitty little stones, but I think that's meant to be rice, and on top of his head it looks like fish eggs. Fish eggs! So what, the sea is filled with sentient fish, and one living piece of sushi? The only small mercy here is that they didn't film this live action. Otherwise it would be an American guy in yellow face called Mr. Human Meat. Yes, I know. Sashimi is raw fish and sushi is about how you prepare the rice. I know that. I wasn't willing to forego the joke for that reason. I was going to share the voice actor and take the piss. This is the guy who voices Professor Shark as well, but he passed away in 2022. And I don't want to do that, so rest in peace. Mr. Sushi doesn't, or at least he pretends he doesn't know what Muggles and Joy have done, so they are forced to tell him that they've been lying and slacking off. For some reason, Mr. Sushi is the only character with a different facial animation. Why is the nonsensical, racist creature the only one they put any effort into? Why? Mr. Sushi is upset with them and Joy is concerned that their reputations are going to be plankton from now on. Is that racist in the fish world? Mr. Sushi, despite being sold as a real tough cookie that will finally straighten them out, is actually kind of cool about it. He's cooler than the others, than Mr. Flips for sure. He reassures the kids that Jesus is about forgiveness and it is so hard to concentrate on what's going on underneath the racist accent that I just can't. Let's get through this as quickly as possible. Mr. Sushi reminds us that God's curse afflicts the wicked, but he presses those who do right. Weirdly, Mr. Sushi then rewards Muggles and Joy 
for their shame, for feeling ashamed, by taking them to a secret place, an old sunken ship. Yes, Mr. Sushi has a secret place that he's taking the children to. I hate my life. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Sunken ship. So there are humans in this talking fish world. Sushi says in his horrible, horrible voice that the best thing about this spot is that it's full of coral and stuff, giving them a great place to study. And importantly, to impress Professor Shark. Sushi tells them one more time that yes, Jesus does forgive them, and they're just stoked. They promise to be honest at all times from now on. They go back to Professor Shark to tell him everything they've learned, and for once, he makes an actually good point about how they've learned from their mistakes. Yay! Children are allowed to be fallible. They reveal their special treat for Professor Shark, which is just that they've now done their homework, and all is well. They love Professor Shark, they love their reef, and they love Jesus. Episode over. Thank God, no more Mr. Sushi. Next episode, muggles enjoy with God in their hearts, blah blah blah! Praise God! Woo! Guys, it's a dramatic start to this one. There's a hair in my mouth. Muggles and Joy are returning to their new reef after strong currents destroyed their old one. Again, it seems like that would have made a much more interesting episode, but then people would have had to actually animate some things, so we're just watching them talk about it. It's the same reef, by the way. As in, the background is exactly the same. They made it canon that their reef got destroyed, and they went to a new one, and they didn't even bother just moving things around. It's literally exactly the same background. How insane is that? Professor Shark is just so proud of you, little fish, just like he is every day. They all say praise Jesus and big each other up, nothing new here. Professor Shark says Muggles and Joy should teach a Sunday class. They don't even get five minutes in this show to mourn the loss of their old reef. They've just gotta keep up the constant positivity in the face of even a natural disaster. And the professor sends the kids to check on their friend Boo cakes. As his long-time seabed was washed away by the currents, Muggles and Joy are like, oh no, how terrible, we better check he's okay. Muggles and Joy swim to meet up with Pete. What? What is it with this show and just ramming completely unnecessary middlemen? Middlefish? Just into the episodes. In this case, apparently they needed directions to boo cakes. You tell me what this does for the storytelling because I'm at a fucking loss. Anyway, Pete looks like this and he has a surfer dude voice because why the fuck not? They have a, for once, blessedly brief conversation, although that does render it more pointless feeling, he points them in the right direction, tells them Boo Cakes, is that, is that really his name? Boo Cakes is feeling bummed out and also in this direction and off they go. Boo Cakes is a manta ray, also with eyes the size of fucking planets. The narrator refers to him as the kid's good friend, which makes it even weirder that they had to meet up with some rando to ask for directions, but okay. Whatever, I guess. They meet up with Boo and they offer their sincere condolences and a shoulder to cry on. Just kidding! <laughs> Imagine. No, much like in the scary Henry Gratitude episode, Muggles and Joy tell Boo Cakes to cheer up. He still has his health and Jesus still loves him. He's literally, just now, lost his home. If that happened to me, and someone told me to cheer up, I'd fucking scream. Boo has kind of a hilarious response to Joy going on about how, in good or bad, you always have Jesus. So I hear. I'm taking that. He adds that the seabed was all he had, and Joy tells him to cheer up again. Callous bitch. Also, I was under the impression that seabed referred to the ocean floor, like the whole sea floor. So I'm a little confused about what exactly he's lost. Muggles and Joy give Boo Cakes more mush about Jesus, they read a Bible verse about getting up after you fall, and Boo is like, wow! Because there are no characters with actual real emotions in this. Boo is like, that's rad that Jesus loves me all the time. But what about having somewhere to live? I'm just a, I'm just one manta ray, yo. Muggles responds to this by telling Boo Cakes that we're all perfect in Jesus's eyes. That's not what he was fucking saying, Muggles. He's saying he's just one guy, how is he gonna find a new home? Your Jesus quotes are not helping. Joy literally tells Boo to stop standing around feeling sad. Stand around, says the fish to the manta ray. Why do they even have the word stand in the fish kingdom? Anyways, get off your sad fish butt and let's go look for a new home for you. Boo Cakes goes off with the kids and they find a new spot for him. And this time, this time, they use wildly different stock footage as the background of this scene. So it's got realistic fish in the background. Which is fucking bizarre. Why did they do this? Is the canon meant to be 
that those types of fish also exist and those are the non-sentient ones that get eaten? Either way, it looks goddamn ridiculous. Joy delivers another belter of a Jesus has a reason for everything, even if the thing seems shitty. Which is just one of the worst things to say to somebody who's just lost everything in a natural disaster. This is a reminder that is what has happened. This highlights one of the fundamental mistakes this show makes, right? If I'm to take it seriously for a moment. The show goes really hard on this always be cheerful and thankful even if things are bad, which I disagree with on principle, but fine. But they always include an upside. The bad thing usually ends up being good overall. In this instance, Boo Cakes finds a new home and it's three times larger than his old one. Great! But sometimes bad shit happens and there isn't an upside. This doesn't give kids any tools to deal with things actually being bad. It doesn't even have conversations around them. In fact, it gives the opposite of good advice because they just keep telling sad people to cheer up in Jesus' name. If kids actually took in this message, all they'd get is guilt when they felt bad because something bad happened. Whatever, it's all sunshine and rainbows for Boo Cakes, another job well done for Muggles and Joy, back to Shark, tell him what they've learned, and so on. They repeat the Bible phrases that Pete taught them again. There's one more episode, guys. One more episode. When I first watched this, I thought the previous one was the final episode. I have never been so disappointed in my life. Muggles and Joy, swimming around. Amen, Joy, amen, Muggles. Hearts full of God, let's fucking go. Oh my God, I didn't shout this out. Everyone who suggested I use an easel to hold up my board instead of a wobbly pick-and-mix box. You're so smart! I did it! Thank you. Fish kids have spent today helping other fish clean up their reefs. There's a little bit of an environmental moment in here where Joy and Muggles lament the ocean filling up with things that shouldn't be there, like plastic bags. I approve of this message. Anyway, that's all a relevant backstory, like they, for some reason, start every episode with. Let's see what Professor Shark is up to today. He's at the tippity top of his food chain. Yeah, who else is in that food chain? Right, don't panic, guys, but for the first time ever, Professor Shark is not having a good day. Joy asks him what's wrong, and he says it's fizzy, and for a second I forgot that was the name of the pufferfish, and I thought he was having, like, a digestion problem. <laughs> no, Fizzy promised Rosie, who the fuck is Rosie, that they would play together today, and Fizzy hasn't been around, and Rosie's really upset. What do you think happened? Eaten by a shark. Eaten by a shark. Eaten by a shark. Professor Shark says as far as he knows, Fizzy is fine, it just seems like she forgot, and Muggles is like, that sure is inconsiderate. Bitch, she can't help if she forgot. Was she supposed to write it down in her fish diary? If she seems to have just forgotten, why isn't Rosie swum by her coral? Or whatever. No, she's gonna sit around crying about it while the rest of Fish Town slags Fizzy off. Stupid asshole fish. Joy offers for them to go find Fizzy. Here is the dialogue to prove I'm not making it up. Maybe we can find Fizzy, Professor. I share that with you because this is what happens next. Muggles and Joy swim double time to find little Rosie. Why does this show do that? This is at least the second time they've been like, we're off to find Steve, and then immediately after it's like, they made their way to see Gary. Is the writer an amnesiac? What the fuck is going on? Muggles and Joy meet up with Rosie, Rosie, who is still waiting all sadly at the playground. Rosie has this hideous children's voice that makes me want to tear my skin off. You know when they slip W's in the middle of words where it doesn't even make sense just to make it sound childlike? It's hideous. I also thought we were on a time crunch here because Professor Shark was saying the day's nearly over. Why aren't they beelining for Fizzy? Makes no sense. Rosie is really bummed and super annoying about it and Joy tries to cheer her up by really hoping for a super good reason that Fizzy isn't there. Like, maybe she got sick. Sometimes in life, a friend is late to something. I tend to hope the opposite. I tend to hope they did just forget. Or maybe they slept in, their alarm didn't go off, their phone's dead. I don't find myself hoping that they've been hit by a bus because otherwise I'll be really offended. What is wrong with these children? <laughs> Rosie is like, I'm getting tired from all the waiting. I'm gonna take a nap. And Muggles actually says, let's give Fizzy the benefit of the doubt. Remember the time she got her fin stuck in those fiber optic cables? How? Joy adds an example, all the time she thought she was slim and got stuck in a porthole. Joy's moral position is very inconsistent, especially upon whether or not you should make fun of someone. They laugh about how clumsy Fizzy is, and Rosie is just stuck being a fucking downer. I thought Fizzy was my best friend, but obviously she doesn't want to play with me. Shut up, Rosie. I don't want to play with you. Go hang out with Scary Henry. Before we move on, what are these little poops? Are they shells? They're so distractingly poopy. Muggles and Joy meet up with Fizzy, finally, who is clearly not sick or stuck in a cable or, you know, dying, so that means she's in trouble. The fish mention Rosie and it quickly becomes clear Fizzy thought their play date was tomorrow. Or rather she thought today was Wednesday, but it's actually already Thursday. 
Oh no! Also, fish use days of the week. Moving on. My sense of direction is terrible. And my memory's nothing to write home about either. Shit, I think I relate to Fizzy. Fizzy is like, oh no, oh geez, what do I do? And get ready for another weirdly jarring moment. We've heard the fish use the phrase standing around despite not having legs. They talk about the good book and picking up signals, even using days of the week, which happened a second ago. But in this instance, Joy says, how about you come apologize in fish? Meaning, I presume, in person. Of all the weird nonsensical human language that these fish use, why did the writer decide that person was clearly ridiculous? It took me, an adult human, like 10 seconds of processing to work out what Joy actually meant here. All you're doing is tripping up your child viewers, the inconsistencies in this universe, they have put no thought into any of it. Fizzy says, yes, let's go. They go back to see Rosie at the playground. I think this is the first time we see a perspective change. I had to replay this part four or five times to understand what was going on. Initially, it's like, hey, they're showing Rosie from a different angle and the background matches up. How neat. It's a bit fucking late, but nice. But when the others appear, they flip the shot. The only way this makes sense, the only way this works physically, is if they're approaching Rosie from the front, but they swim past her during the close-ups and then she turns around. But why the fuck would they do that? Because they don't have a reverse angle for this shot, I guess? Which begs the question, why use that other perspective at all? Just a little bit of visual insanity thrown in near the end to keep us on our toes. Rosie is like, oh, I'm so hurt. And Fizzy explains that she got the days wrong and apologizes and is like, I'm just a clumsy little fish. And they both reassure each other that they are in fact best friends. It's all very sweet. I'm a pink fish. We are loyal to the end. Weird colour-based stereotype, but whatever. They're both happy, they agree to play together tomorrow, all is well. Well done, Muggles and Joy, although they didn't really do very much in this episode. They go back to Professor Shark to tell him what they learned about keeping promises? Okay. They all laugh at Fizzy's foolishness, the most cursed laugh. <laughs> <laughs> Muggles is like, hey, we did learn about the importance of keeping our promises, and Joy is like, yeah, for us, our friends, and for Jesus, who knows everything we do and every choice we make. You thought Father Christmas was creepy. They really wangled Jesus right in at the end here, like, usually they get some parables or passages from the Bible as part of the resolution, but the God stuff wasn't really involved at all here. Joy just, like, slipped in at the end to remind us that Jesus sees everything. Professor Shark gives us a passage from Joshua, which seems pretty unrelated. Not one of their enemies withstood them. <laughs> Hooray! War and death! Thanks, Professor Shark. Muggle summarizes the point for us, which is apparently that God leads by example. Jesus keeps his promises. They really use God and Jesus interchangeably in this show, which kind of, it feels weird to me. This is pretty fundamental Old Testament anyway. God cannot, according to the Bible, break his promises, which is interesting. It kinda seems like a lot of the promises God made disappeared along with him a few thousand years ago. So maybe there is a time limit on promise keeping. You wouldn't skip out on a play date with Jesus, would you? Eh, depends which one. If it's this Jesus, that I might just. Or this one, probably. Or actually, this one. Now, if we're talking about Jess Franco, director of Count Dracula with Christopher Lee and many other low-budget, vampire-themed exploitation movies, now I'm interested. How many films did Jesus Christ make about knife-wielding vampire lesbians? Not enough. The ending of this fish film sees muggles and joy, with hearts full of love for Jesus, etc., going out to spread his message to the four corners of the world, which is a hell of a job for two small fish children, but whatever, they're happy. Roll credits. That was... One of the worst viewing experiences of my life. And I saw Step Up To The Streets in the cinema. I fell asleep in that, I couldn't do that here. Wow Now Entertainment is just one of a huge host of company, barely companies, set up just to make a quick buck off of Christian-friendly kids' cartoons. The kind of shit that gets played on repeat at Religious Playgroup on YouTube. It doesn't have to make sense, it's got bright colours, and you can occasionally pick up the word Jesus. The 3D design. Again, design feels like a strong word. The 3D design and the animation is the laziest thing I have ever seen. The single laziest thing. I mean, this is number one, top of my list, because they had maybe two anim cycles for every main character, idle and talking. They didn't bother to lip sync any of the talking, they just cycle an animation of their mouths going up and down. Bah, 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 bah. By default, every character is designed not even just with a neutral face, but with this huge creepy smile. So you end up with shit like, Professor Shark or Scary Henry, who are supposed to be in a bad mood, with this same default face, like... 
There are a very limited number of backgrounds. A lot of the action takes place in the open ocean, which is just a weirdly shallow bit of empty water. There's no cohesion between the locations. You never see anyone travel anywhere. There's just this kind of, there's just this location, this location. Sometimes the open ocean is in between. Often the backgrounds are populated with coral reef type assets many of which we saw floating above the ground or hovering in the air perfectly still as if there's no current except when you see a piece of seaweed which has an idle animation suggesting there's a strong current which doesn't match the rest of the scene or the characters. They introduce a life-changing event in the middle of this show that forces the fish out of their home and to build a new one and the show carries on in their new reef using the exact same fucking background. They don't even flip it or something. Every now and then there's a piece of stock footage in a completely different style, one that's like photo reel and it's either used as filler or very strikingly as a background. So there are realistic fish swimming around and realistic corals. I mean, what does this mean in terms of the world we're looking at? Do you even understand what I'm saying? Technically, creatively, logically, this film, which isn't even a film by the way, it's a series of short episodes stuck together with stock footage and a shitty bubble animation. <sighs> Relax. This thing fails on every front. It is a disaster. You know, I could stand all of the technical bollocks, even the complete lack of character animation or other designs, if it had good and consistent storytelling. Fuck if it does. Things like the background play into the storytelling. How believable is this new reef thing if we're still looking at the old reef? Children aren't fucking stupid. The characters are so irritating. Muggles and Joy are the most goody two-shoes little bastards on the planet. Except for that one episode where for about three minutes they're perfectly content with lying. No consistency! They are extremely rude to characters' faces one minute, next Joy is telling Muggles off for calling a whale big, and then she's taking the piss out of a pufferfish for thinking that she's slim! <gasps> there is no consistent universe in this show that we can understand. I know it's a kids show, I get that, but the best kids shows are made with the same amount, often more care, than TV for grown-ups. Quick shout out, and something that I've been using as a palate cleanser after I watched this garbage. My buddy Conla has been working on this adorable kids show called Tweedy and Fluff. It's stop motion animation if you're in the UK, it's on Channel 5. It's so cute. It does make this extra horrifying in comparison, but if you need to have a quick, just watch the trailer on YouTube. Just cleanse yourself, remember what good kids TV can be like. The universe is already inconsistent because of the background thing. There are occasionally hyper-realistic fish swimming around in the background. The two little fish characters talk to their shark friend about all the predators out there. They're also friends with a swordfish and a whale. And they offer the whale a crustacean farm to eat from, even though they're also friends with crustaceans. It's a fucking nightmare. And then, the voices. Friends, the voices. Why? Why? Why are so many of them trying to do an English accent? If you're making a TV show and you can't do an accent, don't just give it a go. Don't do it. If you're really committed to this one fish having a Scottish question mark accent, for whatever reason, I don't know why a fish has to have an accent, at least do a bit of training. We all love a nice posh English lady narrator, but would it have made a difference if she had done that narration in her own neutral accent? She uses her normal American accent for some of the other characters and they sound normal. It would only be an improvement not to have the accents. It doesn't make any fucking sense. And we can't talk about voice and design and all of this without mentioning Mr. Sushi. Mr. Sushi, the universe breaking, completely illogical character with a racist design, a racist accent. I, I can't think of a single reason for putting Mr. Sushi in this show. Why have a show featuring all different kinds of fish and aquatic mammals, Mr. Flips the dolphin, Fizzy the puffer fish, and then write one character who is a sentient piece of rice and seaweed if they really wanted to have a Japanese character. How about a koi? They put a puffer fish in the show, they could have used that. A shark, any kind of sea thing native to the Sea of Japan would have done. And then you wouldn't have a piece of fucking human created food as a character. This is obvious to 99% of people. But in case the 1% who are like WoW now are listening, if you can't access a diverse range of human voices for your show, don't just give it your best bash. Just use your own accents. I cannot comprehend why someone would make this choice. There we go. Horrible grift. Laziest thing I've ever seen. And tragically, I bet they make fucking bank 
off of farming out hundreds of these lazy, stupid, ugly cartoons. And that makes me weep for humanity. I hope whoever is ultimately responsible for WoW Now falls in a bin and gets an old banana peel stuck to their face. If you enjoyed this video, <laughs> consider giving it a like, maybe subscribing so you don't miss more. There are other movie recaps and reviews on this channel. This kind of video, a movie recap and a review, takes a lot more work than most of my content. It takes much, much longer, and they tend not to perform quite as well as other stuff. So if you do like these, showing your support would be really, really appreciated. Maybe even give it a share. Send it to a friend you think might like it. Anything helps. You can also become a channel member if you would like comment priority. You also get some silly little emotes. The best way to support this channel is via the Patreon. You get some exclusive videos. I'm starting my next musical theatre course again soon, so there's going to be more singing on there, which you don't have to watch if that sounds awful. There's other stuff too. If you're not sick to death of my voice, you can consider checking out Emma Thorne backstage where I post vloggy content. I open my PO box mail. There's vibes. There's aquarium vibes. If you want to see some real fish, just swimming about, having a nice time. That'd be a good planet planet cleanser. Well, you can also find gaming content over at Little Duck Gaming. I've done lots of spooky stuff for Halloween for October, so check those out. You can also find me gaming live over on Twitch at Emma Little Duck. Once again, thank you so much for watching. I hope you have a very lovely week, and I will see you really soon. Mm -hmm.